The Simpsons is the Discordian operation that's been ruthlessly satirizing the American dream since 1989. Fashioned out of Matt Groening's Pacific Northwest upbringing, his dystopian hippie punk comic strip Life in Hell gained almost instant success, introducing him to Hollywood producer and Gracie Films founder James L. Brooks. Assembling a notoriously diverse team of white guys from across the political spectrum, they would take on the guise of traditional family sitcom and begin to deconstruct the saccharine illusion of Western suburban life for the unsuspecting masses. In this series, we will explore the subtext and symbolism of perhaps the most ubiquitous global media phenomenon in modern history. Homer Simpson was canonically born on June 10, 1955, and represents our standard apolitical boomer. Handed a salaried factory position right out of high school. I didn't even know what a nuclear panner plant was. And married to his first love, whose romantic choices were him or a sexual predator, 100% of Homer's anxiety stems from an unwillingness to father his three unwanted children. He takes this anxiety out on his only male son, in the most lighthearted and comedic form of child abuse ever shown on television. Bart Simpson is the philosophical antithesis to Homer's patriarchal tension. Unreserved and outspoken, yet incredibly selfless and loyal, he finds himself working amongst various intersectional cadres with the shared intent of disrupting the status quo. Born on April 1, 1979, he embodies the archetypal trickster, often running the gamut of chaotic alignment in the span of a single episode. Lisa Simpson is Bart's generational counterpart, born on May 9, 1981. Deeply spiritual and convicted, she seeks to enact justice through established channels, which often leads to her compromising on her beliefs. Although just two years younger, she contrasts her brother's Gen X ennui with a distinctly optimistic, millennial perspective. Regardless of their predilections, Neither Bart nor Lisa have access to class consciousness, as represented by Principal Skinner, the disgraced Vietnam War veteran with an Oedipus complex that runs Springfield Elementary. But that's another video. This stale miseducation is reinforced by Marge, our quintessential liberal. She requires the structure of the system to function and expresses her many talents by taking on various odd jobs. You missed the baby? You missed the blind man? A proponent of manners and respectability politics. She goes high when others go low which allows misogynistic ignorance to rule her life unabated. She is a veritable broken record, asserting that everything will work out as long as we all contribute and are nice to each other. Born on June 16, 1988, Maggie Simpson is our true revolutionary in the flesh. She seizes the means, stands up to bullies, and shoots wealthy industrialists on sight. She does not speak, she only acts. While the first couple of seasons offer mild parodies of contemporaries like Full House and Step by Step, the show hit its stride when writers began to implement the B-plot. This opened the door to a world of diverse characters and locations unrivaled in mainstream media. Yes, I, I understand the entire voice cast is white. Some of them are even... Hey, what's happening, man? This is Bart Simpson. <laughs> Just kidding. Don't hang up. This is Nancy Cartwright. Hey, Bart, and this is a very special phone call to you. I'm now auditing on new OT7. Anyway, season four's last exit to Springfield... Battle plan! Lisa needs braces. Yeah, that one. ...is a particularly relevant introduction to the intersectional politics of the show. In it, Homer's own lived experience persuades him to speak out in favor of a worker strike, becoming union president in the process. The episode begins with a clip from the movie McBain, an elaborate Easter egg about the 1980s drug trade that funded far-right terrorism in South America. The sheer absurdity of statements like Ten times more addictive than marijuana and To human misery gets juxtaposed with the stark reality of true evil as Mr. Burns diabolically watches a window washer struggle for his life. Evoking a classic pre-internet meme, Smithers then makes reference to the infamous death and purported burial of controversial Teamsters leader Jimmy Hoffa inexorably linked to the National Freight Unions and the, shall I say, independent entrepreneurial endeavors that happen to have influence on said industry, Hoffa would be indicted on multiple counts of bribery and conspiracy in 1964. His 1975 attempt to regain power of the union didn't sound so good to the ears of Genovese family member Anthony Provenzano, nor was it very palatable to his associates, Salvatore and Gabriel Braguglio. I had the ability to be able to secure jobs on the outside for people who are on the inside, which is a necessity to secure a parole. So, in lieu of this troubling information, 
they invited Mr. Hoffa to peruse the foundation of a new construction site in East Rutherford, New Jersey. Real up close and personal like, if you catch my drift. He would be declared dead in 1982. Flashing back to 1909, a young Montgomery Burns and his industrialist father inspect their latest acquisition. As a clearly underage laborer gets shaken down by goons, they prophesize the future uprising of the working class. One day we'll form a union and get the fair and equitable treatment we deserve. Then we'll go too far and get corrupt and shiftless. Under orders from JFK, who was literally talking about union participation leading to a communist revolution when he spoke out about secret societies. We are told that foreign correspondent Marx, stone broke, and with a family ill and undernourished, constantly appealed to Greeley and managing editor Charles Dana for an increase in his munificent salary of $5 per installment, a salary which he and Engels ungratefully label as the lousiest petty bourgeois cheating. <laughs> The words of John F. Kennedy and C. Montgomery Burns reflect the heartless contempt those with generational wealth have for the common people. I hope they kill that iron yuppie. Thinks he's so big. As Mr. Burns attempts to rescind pages of deviously corrupt union policies, we see the kind of hateful and aggressive rioting that goes on the moment those uppity, entitled workers don't get exactly what it is they think they deserve. What do we want? Union strikes and protests are a categorical response to violent and aggressive behavior from corporations. Restricting access to basic needs is violence. The absolute power obtained by union leaders is in no way comparable to that of CEOs or shareholders. Without strong and uncompromising representation, even a group of nuclear technicians can get swindled out of proper health care with petty offerings of bread and circus building on a subplot that would gestate over the next two seasons. Who is that firebrand, Smithies? Oh, that's Homer Simpson, sir. Simpson, eh? New man. We return to the meeting hall where Homer is being voted in as union president. In a nearly unanimous vote, we hear a single dissenting voice in the background. When this errant vocalization is called out later on, the culprit passes the blame on to a fellow worker. For every leader that rises to power through the respect and admiration of the people, there is a litany of corporate pawns seeking to infiltrate and dismantle their movements with intentionally divisive rhetoric, with negotiations escalating. Oh my God, he is coming on to me. We get glimpses of Lisa's childhood trauma at the hands of a deranged orthodontist. Driven by an irrational fear of crooked teeth, Marge is pressured into elective surgery for her eight-year-old. This scene not only highlights the cold brutality of the American healthcare system, it calls attention to the strange decisions parents are encouraged to make in the hopes of developing societally acceptable offspring. Then there's this scene, which I'm sure has nothing to do with the creator's predilections. Recreating Jack Nicholson's transformative performance in 1989's Batman, we once again see the juxtaposition of outlandish cartoon villainy versus the real-world criminality of the corporate elite, who own literal sweatshops and call upon... Hired goons! Hired goons. To strong arm the proletariat. Here, we see the unification of seemingly apolitical workers with progressive youth movements, from the anti war movement of the 1960s to the Black Lives Matter movement of today. Large scale protests start when people's lives are in jeopardy and are well underway once people start writing songs about them. Still, political art serves a valuable purpose it uplifts and amplifies movements. At this point, Mr. Burns calls in some strike breakers, the kind they had in the 30s. And we are privy to the modern practices of the aging militant conservative. Listen, people know what they're doing when they endlessly talk your ear off with random whataboutisms and personal anecdotes that make the case for every imaginable exception to any given stance. Their goal is to exhaust you. That's all. Smart line. The power plant strike. Argle bargle or foo for all. Another way we're all being manipulated into right-wing incrementalism is through criticism of a so-called liberal media that time and time again is proven to promote far-right agendas while stifling the voice of the working class. In a last-ditch effort to retain power, Mr. Burns shuts off the town's electricity, which only embiggens the people of Springfield to protest and further unifies the striking workers. Defeated, Mr. Burns concedes to the union's demands on the condition that Homer resign as president. Things go back to normal, with the town's thriving sex work and prank bodily fluid industries back at full capacity. Yay! The now-insured Simpson family gets the unnecessary dental procedure they were sold. And the episode ends with a third-rate medical professional carelessly wasting potent pharmaceutical supplies. Thanks for watching. What episode should we do next? 
Let us know in the comments. Shout out to all our patrons. Join for as little as 111 and come chill with us on our growing Discord server. It's pretty fun. More What Rage Against the Machine was talking about on the way, as well as GTA San Andreas's anti-capitalist message. I promise. So stay tuned. Good night and good luck.